Hello, and I'm Paul Beckwith. This is take three at the on the animal farm here. I've got Shackleton the Explorer, and uh, I've got a dog uh, who refuses to uh, not uh, show affection to this kitty cat. So I'm just gonna have to uh, bribe them both with food. There we go. So in this video, I wanna talk all about the Arctic uh, sea ice loss and how it's projected to lead to more frequent strong El Nino events. So we know that we're losing Arctic sea ice. You know, the big question is, a uh, thing that we don't know is how, it, how long it will take to have a so-called, what I call, the, the phrase I use is blue ocean event. You know, I coined the phrase a uh, number of years ago. So how long uh, it will take to have the first uh, summer melt so that we lose all of the Arctic sea ice. What I think will happen is the remnants or what's left. Um, well, the last remnants of Arctic sea ice in the summer will be circling the, the North Pole. It, it won't be uh, fast ice, so-called fast ice, which is stuck to the land as many scientists, many climatologists are still saying, you know, will occur. But I think that's completely out to lunch. So. Um, this new peer-reviewed paper uh, came out fairly recently. Um, it's um, open access. It's called Arctic Sea Ice Loss is Projected to Lead to More Frequent Strong El Nino Events. So, so that's the, the gist of this, this topic. And I will explain uh, the paper in great detail because it's so important. Um, you know, a world without Arctic sea ice is going to be quite uh, different from what we have today. Okay, so let me just uh, get set up here. Squeeze in, uh, get all my ducks in, in row aligned. Okay, so this is the uh, University of Albain, Albany, in, in the State University of New York um, article recent article and it was from uh, September 29th, 2022. So study, Arctic sea ice loss leads to more frequent strong El Nino events. So over the last 40 years, a rapid shrinking of Arctic sea ice has been one of the most significant indicators of climate change. The amount of sea ice that survives the Arctic summer has declined 13% per decade since the late 1970s. Projections, the best um, peer-reviewed um, paper, scientific projection, show the region could experience its first ice-free summer by 2040. This rapid melting is not just disruptive to the, the region, it may also have a lasting impact on global weather patterns, according to a new paper from the University of Albany, 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 <laughs> Albany research, researcher. So it's a nature communications paper. The researchers have revealed that the magnitude and the pattern of the Arctic sea ice loss can directly influence El Nino's, the ENSO pattern. As the Arctic becomes seasonally ice free, so blue ocean event, no ice in September, first summer, where, where we have a completely open Arctic Ocean. When that happens, the frequency of strong El Nino events will have increased significantly. So El Nino is a complex weather pattern. It occurs when surface water in the central and eastern Pacific Ocean becomes warmer than average. The east winds, now east winds blow from east to west. That's the def meteorological definition. When we say an east wind, it's blowing from the east to the west. When they're blowing weaker than normal, the water can slosh across the Pacific and build up on in the eastern Pacific Ocean. These events, which happen every few years, you know, the period's quasi-periodic, two to seven year cycle. Right now we're in the third year of a strong La Nina, the opposite to El Nino. That can produce unusual and sometimes dangerous weather conditions around the world, including droughts, floods, and st severe storms. Well, we're having, having all of those things in a La Nina. 
Prior to this study, little was known about whether the dwindling or disappearing should be Arctic sea ice is capable of influencing strong El Nino events. Um, okay, so this is a very landmark paper. El Nino is an important climate phenomenon recognized as a driver of climate variability responsible for large and diverse societal impacts. So this study for the first time finds that large Arctic sea ice loss directly influences these global climate extremes, including an increase in the frequency of strong El Nino events and a decrease in the uh, frequency of La Nina events. Um, so they ran time slice model simulations that relied on atmosphere, land, ocean, and sea ice variables to determine the influence of Arctic sea ice loss on El Ninos. So before they ran the simulations, they fixed the Arctic sea ice cover um, during three different periods, okay? And then they ran the simulations and then they had the sea ice uh, changing and then they fixed it in the case where there'd be no sea ice um, and, and ran the simulation. So they did all of these things on using NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and it's the CCSM, Community Climate System Model. It's a global climate model that provides state-of-the-art computer simulations of the Earth's past, present, and future climate states. So they found no significant change in the occurrence of strong El Nino events if there was only moderate Arctic sea ice loss, which is what we have to date. However, as the ice loss continues and the Arctic becomes seasonal, seasonally ice-free, the frequency of strong El Nino events increases by more than one-third. Actually, it's, it's between a third and a half, sometimes approaching a half, depending on which model you use. So after decades of research, there is general but not universal agreement that the frequency of El Nino events, especially strong, extremely strong El Nino events, will increase under greenhouse gas warming. See, since Arctic sea ice is projected to continue to decline dramatically, it's important to assess whether the projected increase in strong El Nino can be directly connected. Okay, so they also uh, wanted to separate the role of the Arctic sea ice loss from just greenhouse gas um, emissions and rising greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So they, f they did another experiment where they fixed this, the Arctic sea ice cover um, but increased CO2 levels uh, by 1% for 100 years, starting from its level in the year 2000. From this, uh, they conclude that at least 37 to 48% of the increase of strong El Nino events projected near the end of the 21st century would be associated specifically with Arctic sea ice loss. Okay, so it's becoming clear that climate models need to simulate de decreasing Arctic sea ice realistically in order to correctly simulate El Nino variability. Okay, so this guy um, has also done, he also did a study showing how Arctic sea ice melt is an underlying cause of the shrinking of the Greenland ice sheet observed in recent decades. And he's a lead author of a study a few years ago that aim to improve Arctic sea ice prediction at daily to seasonal timescales using multivariate data assimilation. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so that's the key thing. This is uh, an article where he, the same author um, looked at the Arctic sea ice melt at how it fuels Greenland ice sheet loss melt and therefore rising sea levels. So basically there's blocking high weather systems that are modulated or changed by reduced summer sea ice in the Arctic. And these are contributing to more extreme heat events over Greenland. Um, so it's fueling extensive Greenland ice sheet surface melting, which is in contributing to rising global sea levels. So there's that study um, and uh, that, that was looked at. Um, and uh, then there's another study um, that, that this guy looked at, and this is a study, this is a 2019 paper. Now this, this paper is, um, I'll, I'll talk about a, few, about a few things in here quickly. You know, it's a long paper, it looks at, um, so the, the idea, you wanna predict Arctic sea ice, so how quickly will it take to disappear? 
um, looking at all the factors, and we, we're doing that very poorly right now. Um, the Arctic sea ice, uh, to me, is uh, lasting longer than I would have expected. There are some negative feedback offense, uh, effects, one of the key ones being that as at, when we, you know, in, in after a very, very extensive melt year near with a near minimum Arctic uh, sea ice um, area, you know, mid-September in the Arctic Ocean, there's a lot of open water and that open water freeze can freeze very quickly. And uh, the growth of ice uh, follows um, a, a uh, logarithmic function. So it's very, very fast initially, and then it slows down rapidly as it thickens because um, it's freezing because of the cold air temperatures in the fall to winter, and um, the ice, ice is a good insulator. So when it's open water, it'll form quickly. When it's thin, it'll, it'll thicken rapidly, but when it starts getting thicker, it takes, it's harder for heat to get through the ice, so the rate of growth slows down. But it's a way that, you know, as we get these really, it's a way, it's a way, basically, with the less ice you have, the more rapid the growth. So that's what we're up against right now. Okay, so lots of authors in this paper. Um, and I'm just going to, um, you know, there's, of course, rapid declines in Arctic sea ice have captured attention and posed significant challenges to a variety of stakeholders. There's a rising demand for Arctic sea ice prediction at daily to seasonal time scales. You know, it's very important to the global climate system, to meet, to the jet streams, to weather blocking, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we really need to know, uh, we, you know, there's a lot of push to having better prediction. You know, our prediction on it is very poor. So this is a review paper. It looks at um, using all kinds of different data, uh, simulating it, uh, to get better sea ice forecasts. Um, and uh, also uh, to, to get more info to put in the model. So there's sea ice parameters from satellite remote sensing. Um, they improve model initialization, including concentration, sea ice thickness, and drift, motion of the ice. And they want to incorporate things to enhance the predictability of Arctic sea ice, and they're not really handled that well in the models. This is like melt ponds on the surface of the ice and sea ice leads. So these are openings in the sea ice. Um, and then once you have the initial conditions to get the, um, using uh, more accurate model simulations, forecasts, and observations, assimilate them all together to get the best possible um, uh, prediction. Um, so it's using thermodynamic and dynamic models. The thermodynamic being all the heat heat flows in, in heat reservoirs and the dynamics, the movement of the ice, um, ridging of the ice, opening up of leads of the ice, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the Arctic warming is much faster than global warming. Sea ice cover in the Arctic has declined since at least the early 50s. Negative trends in total Arctic sea ice extent are observed for every month since the late 1970s. Of course, the largest decrease is in September. The ice extent in September is decreased by 3.24 million square kilometers from 1979 to 2017, with significant ice reduction in the periphery of the Arctic basin from the western Beaufort Sea to the northern Kara Lorentz Sea. So there's different, you know, and there's a figure here you know, at the very end, if I can get to it. Uh, yeah, so this is showing, this is linear trends of September sea ice concentration in the Arctic during the period of 1979 to 2017. It's in percentage per decade. So you can see, you know, huge loss of ice here, over 30% per decade. Uh, a little bit of gain here because this ice is at thin, the currents, the um, Beaufort Gyre, uh, circumpolar currents, the transarctic drift, you know, the heavy ice ends up down in this region. Okay, so uh, that's data from the National Snow and Ice Center. Um, if I go back up, uh, here we go over here. Um, and we're always underestimating the, the, the rate of uh, loss of September sea ice in most current climate models. Um, okay, so 
compared to submarine observations during 1958 to 1976, recent satellite data showed that the mean Arctic sea ice thickness has decreased about 50%. And there was an article just in the last few days saying that the uh, you know Cryosphere 2 satellite that accurately measures Arctic sea ice has done it throughout the entire year for the first time. Usually there's too, too many clouds and problems in the summer, but it's managed to circumvent those problems. Um, okay, uh, observations of sea ice mass balance, buoys and satellites show that ice drift speed is increased, which reduces the strength and increases the deformation of sea ice in the Arctic. Okay, so there's lots of reasons that we want to get an accurate prediction. Um, the rapid decline of Arctic sea ice has also coincided with more frequent extreme events in parts of the northern mid-latitude continents. Several winters following an anomalous, anomalously low Arctic sea ice cover had strong cold surges along with heavy snowfall, right? Um, so there's a lot of different groups that are interested in modeling and understanding the Arctic sea ice. You know, the variation in ice cover and thickness regionally influences atmospheric and oceanic conditions, which in turn affects sea ice distribution, concentration and thickness. Okay, so there's, uh, there's lots of work being done to try to improve the model. And uh, I'm not going to go into all of the details. It talks about the instrumentation here. If you want to know how they measure thickness and, you know, how they're trying to improve their predictions, then this just Google, this paper is open source. Uh, just uh, Google the title towards reliable Arctic sea ice prediction using multivariate data simulation. It's a 2019 paper. Okay, so um, there are a couple other things I want to talk. So the different sensors that are on satellites to measure things, um, how they're putting all the things together. They talk about the sea ice drift causing the rafting and ridging and open open divergences. So they're trying to, you know, for low ice fraction, drift speed generally increases with reducing concentration, while for high ice fraction, drift speed is more closely associated with thickness. Um, so they've got, there's all these different sensors to measure it. Um, there's a couple interest, fun things in this paper that I thought how we measure sea ice thickness from space, the Cryosat 2 radar altimeter, uh, much accurate measurements, um, retrieving ice freeboard measurements, uh, along with an estimate of snow depth on the ice, density of the ice, etc. Um, so there's information on those measurements. Um, there's a couple of terms here. Okay, the melt pond fraction. This is a key thing that is being done very poorly. You know, so what when you in the summer you know you see water on the ice do you, do you know if it's a melt pond on the ice or do you know if it's uh you know how deep is it the area and depth of melt ponds is important how do you how are you sure it's a melt pond and not a lead not an opening in the ice okay so um first year ice is on average less deformed than multi-year ice a high surface fraction of first year ice is therefore covered with melt ponds in the summer the albedo of the melt ponds is smaller, than, much smaller than snow and bare ice. Surface albedo decreases as more melt water accumulates on the ice, which absorbs more solar radiation and further melts snow and ice. So it's a very strong feedback. Um, light measurements under summer Arctic sea ice showed that first year ice covered by ponds allows nearly a factor of three more insulation to pass through the ice than multi-year ice insulation, more, more light. Larger pond coverage leads to higher fraction of solar radiation being transmitted through sea ice, enhancing the ice melt, leading to a positive albedo transmittance melt feedback. Okay, so if we understand melt ponds and, and uh, map them much better as, as the summer progresses, then we can greatly increase the skill of our sea ice, our seasonal Arctic sea ice prediction. But to date, melt ponds have not been assimilated to improve the initial sea ice condition. They're not in the models, so this would greatly improve the models. Uh, there, there's, there's, use, there's AI techniques and neural networks to retrieve these ice pond, um, the, the, the melt pond fractions from surface reflectance data from MODIS, the satellite MODIS. 
um, how much snow is on the top of the ice, how, how, you know, is it just open, you know, how much ice is there, how much open water is there, there's all different types of ice, different densities, etc. So all of this data is important. Uh, leads in the ice, so sea ice leads are narrow and nonlinear cracks in the ice pack resulting from the deformation of sea ice and upwelling of warm water. Leads are important sites of heat, salt, and gas fluxes. They strongly influence Arctic sea ice variation, although the total area of the leads is relatively small, but they're very, very important. Of course, um, they have much lower reflectivity compared to the surrounding ice, so they absorb more solar radiation. This warms the water in the leads and it enhances the sea ice melt around the lead, lateral melt. Uh, in the horizontal direction, creates more openings, larger openings, allows more heat to the atmosphere. Um, okay, so uh, the, the, the leads need to be assimilated into the climate models. Um, and uh, there's uh, then data assimilation methods. There's lots of statistical data method nudging is the simplest method called Newtonian relaxation. They use the difference between modeled and background, run the model forward, get the background again, run it forward, do things like that. Um, and interp optimal interpolation uh, is another one. Uh, there's a couple terms that I really want to get to. Um, I'm not, I don't want all of this. You, you know, the idea is to get uh, Kalman filters, ensemble Kalman filters, it's another one. I mean, the ice is a very complex nonlinear system. So they, the models are, are non complex nonlinear models. Um, and there's, a, let me just keep, bear with me for a second. Uh, discussion and summary. So, Oh, I want to, yes, so they, so we're talking about assimilation of data, using data from all different methods on the sea ice to get a better handle on how quickly it's going to melt. But there's also a, so, the so-called, I love this, the jetty framework is also used. And no, we're not talking about, um, we're not talking about jetties that you think of. We're talking, that stands for the joint effort for data assimilation integration, right? Whoever came up with that um, acronym is, is a genius. So a unified community data simulation system is being developed using a common code base. This data, this software encompasses a variety of data simulation methods to, to uh, you know, and then they analyze, they have a whole bunch of different methods and they get these, the error and then by combining an ensemble of all the different methods, they can try to hopefully get the, the most accurate forecast. Okay, so anyway, it's a very long and detailed paper about how we can improve Arctic sea ice prediction. You know, if we account for everything, maybe we can figure out when the first blue ocean event will be, but I think it's just going to happen and surprise us all. I doubt we'll be able to predict it in advance. So getting back to how sea ice affects sea and ENSO. So if you Google, go to Google Images and Google Global Temperature Graph with ENSO Index and you get all kinds of different uh, graphs. And here's one. So this is the El Nino. The warm uh, situation is the red and the not neutral is the gray and the, the La Nina, the opposite is the blue, blue the global temperatures are lower with the La Ninas and higher with the El Ninos. Okay, I can, there's a couple other ones. Here's another depiction, uh, you know, very strong El Ninos are the red, very warm years, strong La Ninas are the blues, neutral or in between are the other ones. Um, this is a very good, depiction um, and there's an article in skeptical science so this is interesting this shows you the enso temperature trends so these are all the okay so it's going to start over again okay this is the uh all the years and then this is just the la nina years and then a best fit line for the la nina years the neutral years 
in a best fit line, and then the El Nino years in a best fit line. If you plot them all together, temperature is warmer in El Ninos and La Ninas by, say, 0 0.15 degrees Celsius on average. So let's see this again. Volcanic years are, the, are also shown. So La Nina years in best fit. Neutral years in best fit. And El Nino years in best fit. And you can see, you know, look at the gap here and estimate uh, based on that temperature scale. And you can see, you know, El Nino years are much, much warmer. So when we have another strong El Nino, we're going to blow apart all the records. This is updated. Uh, this is uh, the other graph goes to 2015. This one goes to 2019. OK, it's the same sort of thing. So La Nina years, neutral years and El Nino years. And then all three combined. And you can see that the, the red line is pulling away a bit from the blue line, I think. Okay. And this is, you can actually run these Earth system, community Earth system models. So the community can run these. If you got a decent computer, you can download the uh, the different mo you can you can look at the different models how they're set up. You can download the whole thing, and you can run these climate models yourself if you've got uh, the inclination to do so. Okay, so this is the uh, this is the key here. This is the paper, the peer-reviewed paper. So I'm going to talk about this. Uh, so. Again, Arctic sea ice loss is projected to lead to more frequent, strong El Nino events. And it's very important uh, because when we have strong El Nino events, we set all time, types of global temperature records and there's lots of grief and destruction from, from extreme weather events around the planet. And we, we've been in, in the third year of the La Nina and once we get out, then because of the, the, the uh, system, the periodicity, we can expect a, a super powerful El Nino and that will blow away all temperature records uh, set to date. Okay, so let's try to see how, more, how much more powerful is the El Nino gonna get as we lose more and more Arctic sea ice loss. So Arctic sea ice has decreased substantially. It's projected to reach a seasonally ice-free state in the coming decades. So that's, you know, blue ocean event. Little is known about whether dwindling Arctic sea ice is capable of influencing the occurrence of strong El Nino, which is a prominent mode of climate variability with global impacts. So based on time slice coupled model exper experiment, so they take a time slice, like a certain time range, between one year to another year, and they do the model, and then do the thing in a different time slice, another time slice, and they compare all the results. So based on the time slice coupled model experience experiments, they show that there is no significant change in the occurrence of strong El Ninos in response to moderate Arctic sea ice loss that is consistent with satellite observations to date. Okay, so to date, the loss of Arctic sea ice that's occurred has not caused a significant increase in the occurrence of strong El Ninos present day thus far. However, as the ice loss continues and the Arctic becomes seasonally ice free, so blue ocean event, we're going to have the frequency of strong El Nino events increasing by more than a third. More than a third. So we're going to have and actually, if you depending on the model, it's between a third and a, and a half. So some models show that it will have 50% more strong El Nino events. Other ones show, you know, about a third, 33%. It's actually 37% to 48% is the actual range, as I'll show you um, as we go down in the paper. Um, and this is... Uh, this, uh, how we define the strength of the El Nino event is defined by the gradient-based indices that remove the mean tropical Pacific warming induced by a seasonally free, ice-free Arctic. So they compare the time slice experiments with greenhouse warming experiments and they conclude that at least 37% to 48%. So that's a third 
to a half of this increase of strong El Nino near the end of the 21st century is associated specifically with Arctic sea ice loss. Further separation of Arctic sea ice loss and greenhouse gas forcing only experiments imply that the seasonally ice-free Arctic uh, might, shouldn't use the word might there, will play a key role in driving significantly more frequent strong El Nino events. Okay, so let's have a look at the, the data, basically. Um, but, for, you know, I guess um, we know, I've said this already, the Arctic sea ice cover has decreased in all months since the early 1950s by nearly half during the summer. This, of course, alters the heat and moisture exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere, and it contributes to Arctic amplification, right? Much darker Arctic. Most current climate models project a seasonally ice-free Arctic before the mid-century, say 2040 is probably the consensus now for these models. Under, under scenarios with future cumulative emissions of 270 gigatons carbon beyond the emissions through 1919, okay, we're no, no sea ice in the Arctic. Um, the Arctic, a large body of evidence in observations and model simulations has shown that Arctic sea ice variability is strongly influenced by the ENSO, by a teleconnections, i.e. the Rosby wave train initiated through tropical convection, the shift of jet streams in response to tropical sea surface temperature anomalies, changes in meridional and zonal circulations and associated heat transports and anomalous transient eddy activity. Okay, so basically when, when there's a strong El Nino, that can cause a, a record melt year in the Arctic is basically what it's saying. When the El Nino is, is uh, not a, when it's neutral, the ENSO is neutral, or in a La Nina, that can actually um, reduce the Arctic sea ice loss. And we've had the latter situation, a strong La Nina, for thir three years running now. Okay, now the other way around, it's the chicken and the egg, the egg and the chicken. The other way around is, is that it's unclear how much Arctic sea ice loss can influence El Nino characteristics and whether such an influence might depend on the magnitude and pattern of Arctic sea ice loss. But there's few studies on this. Okay, so this study is, is a watershed study. It's a key study because it shows that El Ninos get a lot stronger when you get lots less Arctic sea ice. Okay, so this talks about some of the details of what they do and the methods, but let's just go to the results here. So in the tropical Pacific, the response to the moderate reduction in Arctic sea ice, that's model ice P1, that shows a very weak basin-wide SST warming and minimal changes in zonal winds. So no real change in the ENSO. No, which, you know, it also looks, they also look at the thermocline across the equatorial Pacific. So there's no changes in this. But when there's a seasonally ice-free Arctic state, and that's in uh, the model ice P2, there's pronounced changes in the mean state of the tropical Pacific that are reminiscent of El Nino. A greatly enhanced warming is observed in the equatorial Pacific with much larger anomalies of 0.8 to 1 Celsius in the east, which is associated with pronounced westerly wind anomalies in the central and eastern equatorial Pacific. Pacific. The weakened trade winds um, reduce the zonal tilt of the equatorial thermocline and weaken the, ocean, the meridional ocean circulation, so-called tropical cell, particularly on the south side of the equator. Both changes contribute to the intensified eastern warming of the upper ocean. So basically, you've got all this warm water in the West Pacific. You've got strong easterly winds that keeps it there. The uh, thermocline in the ocean is tilted because the water is warm to depth in the West and cooler in the East. Now, the, the trade winds, the easterly winds basically die. The water sloshes across the ocean, reaches the far eastern part of the um, Pacific Ocean at the equator, and we have a strong El Nino as that heat is released to the atmosphere. Okay, so those are basically what is happening. 
So here's some data. These, this is the um, Oceanic Nino Index. Okay, so this is a neutral case. This would be a La Nina. This would be an El Nino. Um, and this would be a strong El Nino and an extreme El Nino here. Okay, so what it's showing is it's showing the historical is the, the gray, the histogram for historical. What we've seen so far is the gray. Um, ice P1 is um, with, uh, with, with uh, sea ice fixed. And ice P2 is when we lose sea ice. So this is a case where we don't lose sea ice. This is a case where the sea ice is gone in the summer. And you can see uh, the effects here of the, so you get the red line here, you get much, much stronger um, El Ninos here, you know, extreme El Ninos, and you get about the same or not, you know, it doesn't, not much change in the just strong El Ninos, but you get way more extreme, extremely strong El Ninos. This is the zonal sea surface temperature gradient. The zonal is west to east. Um, and you get an enhancement of it with strong El Ninos. And this is the meridional, the, the north to south sea surface temperature gradient. And you also get an increase here. So this is, this is the key finding. And you can, there's a table of, so this is strong El Nino events in the time slice coupled model experiment with fixed Arctic sea ice during 1980 to 1999. That's ice hist uh, row two. And then you, um, with the historical simulation, um, okay, and then, so the, the, well, it doesn't say, I mean, basically, uh, this is a historical simulation, so how many El Nino events we get, and uh, this is the simulation, uh, the difference between the, the background, if you like, the normal, and the model with uh, no huge loss of, of sea ice. Okay, not so not much change, but when you have a seasonal ice-free Arctic Ocean, then you get a large increase in the El Nino indices, 7%, 8.3, 13.7% 7 increase. Okay, so the ONI would go up from the, the historical, so 14 plus 7, it would be 20, 21%. Okay, uh, the frequency change is, is 21%, minus 14% or 7% here. Okay, so very, very large increase um, from that table. And this shows you what's going on. So this is the case where you have no Arctic sea ice in the summers. You've got the blue ocean event, you know, no ice at the end of the melt season, and then it extends to most of the summer. Um, and what happens is you get a high over the land and you get an enhanced low, the Aleutian low here, Siberian high. And so you get a very large pressure difference here. So air moves from the high to the low and it deflects because of the Coriolis force, deflects to the right. So the air moving here deflects to the right. So you get a counterclockwise flow around the low or, or the cyclone, and this is anti-cyclone. Okay, so you get winds strongly this way. Well, look what happens with these strong winds here. These strong winds push water, which is built up over here across the Pacific Ocean, establishing a strong El Nino. Okay, so that's basically, that's the gist of it. That's the, the, the you, you lose the Arctic sea ice, in the summer, in the north, you get this strong uh, pressure pattern setting up, very, very deep Aleutian low, strong, powerful Siberian high. That larger pressure gradient causes the uh, motion around the cyclone here. Of course, it's counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. So, and that uh, pattern of winds pushes the water and breaks, so that all the water pooled here the warm water crosses the um, Pacific Ocean and a, a very, very strong El Nino occurs. So that's the basic connection between loss of Arctic sea ice and powerful El Ninos. And there's some, there's, uh, some more details on seasonal sea level pressure, um, 
re the response of seasonal sea level pressure to the seasonally ice-free Arctic. So of course, uh, December, January, Feb February, the biggest effect, uh, there's a bit of a lag, you know, lowest ice, uh, you know, ice decreasing in the summer, blue ocean event, Ergonmo's summer, it takes a while for the ice to reform. So the biggest effects are here. And this is March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. Okay, and then the this shows you the winds. Um, you know, you get these tremendous winds uh, pushing you, pushing you over. And if you just uh, do the simulation uh, with um, atmosphere only changes, um, fixed sea ice, then you don't get those changes, those winds. So it it all comes down to this. You know, so you need um, everything's deflected to the right of the northern hemisphere. You get a very deep low, a cyclone. Air from all around comes in, deflects to the right, causes this counterclockwise flow over the cyclone that pushes the water across and causes a very powerful El Nino to occur. So very sort of, you know, it makes sense. This is changes in the oceanic heat transport. Um, uh, this is... Uh, this is the case where you don't lose the Arctic sea ice, the blue, and this is changes cases where you do. So when you lose the Arctic sea ice, you get a lot more heat moving. Um, you get a lot more heat uh, moving, uh, right, in, in, in moving up. And this, but I mean, this is the temperature. This is a key thing here. And I guess this is the derivative of this. So. Anyway, this is the temperature here. Look at the temperature spike. Sea surface temperature, you get a huge spike. When there's uh, still sea ice, you get this small curve here. When there's sea ice is gone, then you get a huge temperature spike uh, at the equator, as, as you can see you know, mo most clearly from, from this figure again. I mean, this is key. This is a good way to remember it. And then uh, discussion, yeah, so Basically, uh, you know, you can read through this. Oh, oh, well, the, I guess the key thing from the discussion is that there's two types of, um, there's, it, it's been increasingly recognized that there's two types of El Ninos with larger sea surface temperature anomalies over the Eastern Pacific and over the Central Pacific. And that produces different global impacts. The Central Pacific, the CP El Nino, has been suggested to be related to extra tropical atmospheric forcing. Uh, so they look at whether the Arctic sea ice loss affects, how it affects the occurrence of both the CP and the EP El Ninos. Okay, so relative to the case where there's Arctic sea ice, the occurrence of strong uh, Eastern Pacific El Nino does not change significantly, although the strong Central Pacific El Nino becomes more frequent. So that's even the case where we don't lose Arctic sea ice. But when we have seasonal ice-free conditions in the Arctic, the ice P2, we get a substantial increase in the frequency of both the strong Eastern Pacific El Nino and also the Central Pacific El Ninos. The Central Pacific El Nino uh, is more frequent by a factor of two, which is huge. Okay, so both... Uh, Ice, so with no sea ice, the coexistence of both types of El Nino, the so-called mixed type, that's when you have both CP and EP, that increases by a factor of six, a frequency of six times more often. Okay, so in summary, a seasonally ice-free Arctic induces marked changes in the tropical Pacific with an El Nino-like warming pattern. Strong El Nino events become more frequent presumably with continued devastating impacts around the globe. The seasonally ice-free Arctic also induces changes in the ENSO diversity in favor of CP El Nino events and ENSO events of mixed type with SST anomalies spanning both CP and EP regions. Mixed type events are an example of a vexing compound extreme event, a class of extreme events that are gaining increasing attention among scientists and decision makers because of their potential for novel behavior and for enormous uh, societal impacts. Okay, um, 
Should mixed events become more common and more extreme, they could lead to large yet poorly understood teleconnections and impacts. Our results indicate that change in strong El Nino events may depend on the magnitude and pattern of Arctic sea ice loss. And they use two different coupled models, CSM 1.2 and CCSM 4. Um, and they found that the, um, the law, they found that the increase of frequency in the El Nino events varied between one third and one half. So 37% to 48% was the number. These are histograms of El Nino indices associated with greenhouse warming experiments. Um, so they have some more, more data here. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't need to, this is, this is on, yeah, I've, I've talked about the, the key things already in this paper, so I don't think I'll dwell on this. This is where they increased CO2 1% per year, and they found that it didn't have a huge impact on uh, increasing numbers of El Nino events, okay? So, so this by far is the key, um, key figure here, showing how the wind patterns change in the world where we lose Arctic sea ice for the summers, uh, it, we get a lot more of these configurations, these El Nino events occurring. Um, so this is a very, very important and key finding. Thank you for listening. Bye for now.